And we are back on the Zero Hour. I'm Richard R.J. Escal, and with us is William Grider. You know, I'd call Bill a legend, but I hate that because that's kind of like trying to uh, uh, neutralize somebody. What he is is a very active and forceful voice uh, in the areas of politics, economics, finance, and he's re- he's been he was the national affairs editor of Rolling Stone magazine for oh it says here 17 years. Um, former assistant managing editor at the Washington Post. He he does the right kind of reporting. He does the right kind of analysis. He's a great voice. I'm proud to call him my friend and delighted that he's on the show. Bill, thanks for being with us. Thank you, Richard. That's good. Um, listen, I, uh, I loved your piece in The Nation <clears throat> called Merchants of Death Could Make a Lot of Money Off a War in the Ukraine. And, uh, you know, the, the picture that it paints... Uh, might be called extreme if it weren't so readily documentable. I mean, you're basically saying that that we've got a confluence of politicians who are making bellicose talk about what's going on in Ukraine at the same time that we have a lot of arms dealers who would make a lot of money from conflict there. And um, that seems to me like we've heard this song before, man. I got to tell you. For about <laughs> yes, I know. <laughs> So what's going on here? Have we learned nothing well, in 40 years? Richard, you're old enough to remember the origination of, of Merchants of Death, which it probably was in the Stone Ages, actually, but, but, but in our lifetime, that was one of the phrases in the air rather steadily through the 60s and into the 70s when we were all dying over the, the tragedy in Vietnam. And, and uh, in that day... Uh, People talked rather directly and in great detail about the role of the military-industrial complex in our politics and war-making and all the rest. So I thought, watching the Ukraine drama unfold, I thought, first of all, it reminded me that I had been there, actually, when, when these interests, that is Boeing and Lockheed Martin and other major defense manufacturers, were pounding the Tom Toms to expand NATO eastward to Russia. And that occurred in the early 90s and mid-90s during the Clinton administration after the Cold War ended. And some of us had naively thought, well, now we have an opportunity to get rational about our defense industry. But, but And they understood exactly that threat. So they joined what was already a diplomatic argument well well to be really secure we have to we have to spread nato right up to uh, russia's border so so that they won't be able to reclaim these satellite countries which were now liberated at czechoslovakia poland hungary some and many others and that was and there was no secret about that i remember sitting in a meeting of of a, of a defense um, analyst uh, had a conference on uh, wasn't directly on NATO, but it was post Cold War. What do we do with all this stuff? And in the meeting was the, this guy Jackson from from uh, Lockheed Martin, I think, and uh, he he made it very plain that this was their agenda. And they were they worked up without too much difficulty the political support in the Clinton White House and elsewhere to to do this, and it was all high minded, blah blah blah. But the, the the opportunity was was sales of F sixteens and and Hercules air transports and lots of missiles and lots of missile defenses and so on and so forth. And all Americans probably remember that period is well, didn't Clinton cut the defense budget? And that's true, he did. But the hole was quickly filled with these new customers for American armaments. So I well, you have. Go ahead. You have a situation where then in the 90s, we had a window where one might reasonably assume arms expenditures worldwide would drop with the end of the Cold War. And while we made some cuts here, we're still spending an extraordinary amount. And we, you know, obviously the war on terror accounts for some of that, but so does some of the bellicosity, I would say, you know, in, in the Ukraine-Russia situation contributes a national mood that says we want to spend more, and in the meantime, you're saying the arms manufacturers, with the help of our government, Democratic and Republican, yeah. made up the difference by uh, entering these these new markets in the uh, 
in Eastern Europe and elsewhere, and in so doing, escalated tensions while they were escalating sales. And meanwhile, our government institutions were facilitating the yeah. sales. And now you're saying we might even offer uh, low-cost loans to Ukraine so that it can arm itself against Russia. Well, that's the goal, clearly. And they're not, they, again, they haven't been shy about this. If you read the newspapers carefully, you see that they're... Republicans have put in a bill, and they've got 20-plus sponsors and so forth and so on. I mean, I think now we're at, in, only in the huffing and puffing stage in which it's a freebie for the Republicans to dump all over President Obama for not being more bellicose, and that they ingratiate themselves with all of the right people by, by uh, doing that. And then they, you know, it's a, it's like uh, playing a casino. If if they get the right set of bad events, some of this huffing and puffing will turn into real. And that's, you know, you were there. You in your youth, you remember that's that's how we got into Vietnam. That's how we got into Korea. I mean, you could just all of the places we have wound up losing young Americans uh, started in pretty much the same way. And it's always be, comes down to the pride of the governing elites. Well, we have been challenged here. This man Putin isn't listening to us. We have to up the ante and do something more to show him how serious we are. And that Well, it's always it's always fascinating to me too how the we're talking with writer William Grider about Ukraine it's, and, and and American militarism in general, the military industrial complex. It's always striking to me how the emotional needs of the financial elites align so closely with their economic interests. Yeah. And, it, you know, it, it also fascinates me, just parenthetically, that, you know, everyone's saying Obama's not a tough guy like Putin and he's wearing mom jeans or whatever, taunting him to be more aggressive. Yeah. And I would say he's pretty aggressive. And, and, um, and yet Putin is the devil. So, in effect, if you put those two concepts together, aren't they taunting the American president to be more devilish? Yeah. <laughs> That's good, and uh, and I, you know, I think the um, the president. I, I didn't have space in my brief article to get into all this, but Obama has um, has been very ambivalent on this subject of arms exports. And, you know, on one occasion he will take credit for it and say this has been a great boost in our in our foreign trade and so forth and so on, and we're doing better than ever. And then he'll two months later he'll he'll call for a, a report or a study of whether this arms export is really good for world peace. <laughs> I'm, I'm exaggerating only slightly here. Um, I give him a pass on the Ukraine situation because so far, at least, he is he has resisted the uh, the pressures to to uh, keep upping the ante. And and uh, if he's you know if events turn right and and uh and putin has no more immediate claims on territory then then he'll be able to wriggle out of this but um it's you well, know, but it, let it, me it, ask you uh, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt but let me ask you about that though because i'm willing to give him a pass too except that it seems that his administration is in, engaged in some bellicose rhetoric that has made the situation a little worse and yeah. Kerry fell for what seemed to me that transparent ploy about the uh, all Jews must report or whatever it was in yeah, the yeah. state. So, is it, but is that just an, a more example of, of his ambivalence, uh, his ability to be a particle and a wave at the same time, or whatever, this quantum state that he achieves? Uh, it, or is it a lack of leadership? Or is it a guy struggling to figure out what he wants to do? What do you think? Well, I think he started uh, wisely in, a, in 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 that first year or so um, with a pretty straightforward uh, ambition to get out of Afghanistan, and and it, the process was already underway, of, supposedly of getting out of Iraq, but he stayed with it. Uh, he he laid out some um, un unfortunate talk about drawing red lines in Syria. But when uh, but when Syria crossed the red, line, red lines, he didn't do anything. I give him sort of reverse credit for that, right? Because right. <laughs> right. because he you remember he was then hammered for well, you told us you were going to invade Syria. Why aren't you doing it? And he I forget what he said, but he he wriggled out of that one. And so I I have a certain sympathy 
even though you're right in everything you say, he he's been like on so many areas. He's trying to have it both ways, and let's hope he succeeds. By <laughs> you know, I'll, I'll take the bad rhetoric and the and the and the and the silly kinds of threats, so long as he doesn't try to fulfill them. And uh, I mean, he the, the the bottom line in all of this stuff is that. He understands, and I think almost all politicians must understand, that this country would go bananas if, in fact, we started sending real soldiers and real heavy equipment into a war zone. I mean, I would go crazy. I know that, and I think most people forget their politics. It's insane to, to even think about. Right. But, but he's, but but he's know- not yet ready to say, you know what? We've said a lot for a long time that we're the policemen for the world, but Americans have to accept that that's not actually practical. <laughs> we can, it would be nice if we could do it because we're good guys, blah blah blah. But we can't do that anymore. Sooner or later, that that's that reality is going to come home. What what I do fault Obama for is is not making that speech. Now now he's probably said something like that again and again, but it, but again he turns around and says. Says well, the opposite. You know, these, right. these 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 drones are really good. We can fight a war without getting any of our people killed, and it's you know, it's got a little sort of dicey question about what's war right. and what's murder, but but we'll we'll finesse that, and uh, we'll, you know. So he's. Well, I, I got to go to a. Yeah. Let's do this. I got I got to go to a break now. But if you can stick with us, I want to continue this conversation, maybe broaden a little sure. bit. Sure. So if you. If you can do that, that'd be great. We're, we're talking with William Grider, and we will be right back after this on the Zero Hour. And we are back on the Zero Hour with William Grider, writer for the Nation on issues of economics, politics, merchants of death is his, his latest piece on the Ukraine. And uh, I want Bill. I want to set up the next uh, part of this conversation with. A, a couple thoughts, if I may. You know, you mentioned that your piece discusses that when the Cold War ended, arms manufacturers saw a promising new market, and they lobbied policymakers in Washington, courted governments of post Soviet nations, etc. Bill Clinton decided to do it. You're right, cheered on by the arms merchants. Why is nobody talking about that? Yes. Because it because it might sound patriotic, and the media love bang bang, even if the cause is. Stupid. A sentence which made me laugh out loud, by the way. But, uh, of course they do. You know, Dylan saying everybody must get stoned, now it's everybody must get paid. Everybody's making money off this. But my question is, ex- your question is, why is nobody talking about it? You know, we, 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 you mentioned the 60s when people were openly talking about the arms dealers and the merchants of death and the military-industrial complex and the economic forces driving us to yeah. instigate wars that either we fight or we have proxies fight with our weapons and so yeah. on. I, it, what, I just wanted to broaden the conversation a little bit and say, why do you think we're not having that discussion much anymore? Oh, boy. It's, um, it is sad, and um, I think I know some of the reasons. Um, one of them is the, the, uh, the consolidation of the media. Now, there's still a lot of little media around the country doing its thing, and and and, and so we know that you, you're part of that in a way. So am I. But the big main media that that sets the tone and and draws the boundaries around what's news and what gets discussed has lost the uh, you know the sort of diversity it had even just 20 years ago, much less 30 or 40 years ago. So they have their own interest in staying close to the governing elites and the interests that are, that, that implies. I, I, it's not quite saying they're corrupt, but, but they are heavily under the influence of the establishment view of reality. Now, they will, they will bow to the right-wingers because they realize if they don't, the right-wingers will be all over them, so forth and so on. But whatever their real political views are, they don't have the nerve to stand up and ask the kind of questions we're talking about. I think that's part of what it's about. It's 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 almost an economic boundary on what they what they do. And the New York Times, in in my view, is the best of all in in most every way. But even it, and it does brilliant reporting. But even even the Times, 
they're just places it, it doesn't much want to go. <laughs> and, you know, right. and I think uh, there's another generational thing, Richard, that, that I've, you know, you probably recognize the same thing decades ago. But uh, the, the, the upheaval of the 1960s in the war in Vietnam and, and civil rights and, and racial conflict and, and, and Nixonian um, oppression, etc., produced a certain excess among some of us of what we thought was happening. You know, we thought, okay, a door is opening here for some really profound changes. That got shut down very dramatically after the war was over, after Nixon was gone. And as we know, as people have written books about, the corporate financial interests were, in fact, launching their own counter-reformation in that, in that same decade. <laughs> And, right. it, and it more or less succeeded, didn't it? You know, I don't, I don't mean that right. it swallowed everybody up, but it certainly chastened everybody. Well, you know? and I think that, I think there was this fast. I mean, this is a fascinating area, actually. That we, I, I also think there was a move to take that spirit of rebellion and excess. I remember I went to do a semester at the London School of Economics, and somebody had spray painted on one of the buildings the William Blake line: "The road of excess leads to the palace of wisdom." And I thought. I'm going to be really, I'm going <laughs> to feel me. at home here. <laughs> but but the, the, I think they took that excess and flipped it that, because it was driven at the time by a desire to puncture the, 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 the habitual yeah. economic and social patterns, yeah. and they instead subverted it for corporate interests. And you, you know, all of a sudden rock and roll became what they played when they were driving Noriega out of his house or when they right, were, right. Uh, you know, a, 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 everything became corporatized. But I also wonder to what extent, since you mentioned Bill Clinton here and we've got Obama in office now too, I wonder if somewhere along, obviously the Vietnam War was, prose was initiated and prosecuted by Democrats as well, but I wonder if the left has over-identified with, with the political party that can never, they, under the current system, be the force of dissidence and should sort of disentangle itself, at least emotionally, and start talking about things like merchants of death again. I wonder what your thoughts are on that. Well, I mean, good luck to you with, with, that, <laughs> with that proposition. I mean, I've been writing this, as you know, for a number of years, and uh, I haven't seen any rebellions forming around my, my prose. No, I mean, to be serious, um, you're, you're talking about my tender spot because I have been making a case probably more gently than I should have that that until people who are really left liberal progressives whatever they call themselves and constantly repeatedly frustrated by the by the by the party that they that they align with and they are members of until they're ready to really break some eggs and do more than simply uh, Beg and plead and 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 crumble. We'll be in this in that mode, and and uh, it's it, it's not. It didn't start with Obama. It didn't it, it, it's it actually started a bit before Clinton. But it, but I mean, at least in laying the groundwork for it, I, I know that history intimately. But um, they're you know they're winning on this on their bet, which was. We can do this and get away with it as long as we have labor cowed and other activists feel the need to um, not break from us. And when right. I say break, I don't mean start a third party necessarily. I do mean, as we have witnessed in the Republican Party, a willingness to take down some Democrats who you know are never going to change their minds about the big stuff that we care about. And to do it quite openly, and and uh, obviously you can lose that game. You can you can show your impotence rather than your strength. But you, until people are really serious enough about their their values and convictions to do that, I don't think the Democratic Party will change very much. Here we are. Just to add to your disgust, here we are in 2014, and. We already have been told who our Democratic nominee is in 2016. And I would add as a footnote, mess 
Messina, Jim Messina, I think he is. I've never actually met him, but I know lots of people who know him. He's a very effective organizer type with the Obama team, blah, 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 and before that with uh, Tom Daschle, etc. He's over in London now running the campaign for Cameron, the the conservative party's prime minister, his re-election campaign. And I thought, isn't that perfect? <laughs> he not only goes back and forth, but he goes back and forth across international boundaries. And he'll be back in the U.S. He's already got some position in the in the uh, you know uh, draft draft Hillary uh, movement, which is already well funded. I mean, you can go on and on and on. To me, that's a, that's evidence of the the emptiness of party politics. It's, it's a sort of depoliticization, as as I saw one Chinese scholar call it, and it's true. That and and the understanding of that is so widespread. That the, the the group of really intense partisans who really do believe in the Democratic Party can save us keeps getting smaller and smaller, and the, and with smart politics and and clever strategy, the Democrats can still pull in a lot of voters who, who are skeptics. I, I mentioned minority groups, but there are others uh, without without uh, without having to do much for them, and right. and it's an interesting. Game, uh, I shock some of my friends by saying we won't really find out about the Democratic Party's ability to change until they lose everything. Uh, I and I, of course, immediately ruffles their their brow, and uh, and I say I'm not proposing that. I'm just saying <laughs> that's the, that's the dynamics of our situation, and which I well, believe. And I wonder if you. I wonder if you agree with me on this. You know, people get, first of all, I had a conversation with someone. I said, I, I, I couldn't see myself voting for Hillary in 2016. <clears throat> and they said, that's irresponsible. And yeah, I said, well, right, I'm giving right. you, I've been told I'm giving you, I'm giving you two years notice. If I'm that important, what could be more responsible? I'm giving you two years to find an alternative. <laughs> I'm so critical. But that's pretty responsible. But my real point is, I think, and, and, and your, your doom and gloom comment, Hinted on it. I really think it's possible that it won't matter because the base voters at, at some point are just going to get discouraged if the economy keeps getting worse and Social Security gets cut and this happens and that happens. I think it doesn't matter what you or I say. I think that if young people, millennials, and 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 other groups just become disaffected and stop voting, that's going to be far more catastrophic. And I think that's you know one of the outcomes. I don't consider myself. Democrat, I consider myself independent, but I think that's one of the the outcomes I'm trying to avoid for the Democratic Party. And I, yeah. I wonder if you feel the same way. Well, the other variable is the Republicans in, in you know the Post, which does I think really good work covering the, the inside baseball of politics, is already cover, is already reporting that the, the establishment is turning the the. The, the things around, and both in these <clears throat> primaries, the Tea Party crowd is is not winning this year. They're, they're mostly losing. And further, the more they they're trying to get a presentable candidate for 2016 in in place and well prepared and well financed to to bring the party back from the brink of all of the nuttiness. And that probably means immigration. It it maybe means uh, racial issues and some other stuff. But it basically, essentially, um, I I think the the risk for Democrats is that the Republican establishment will succeed and actually nominate somebody who's you know presentable, got his shirt tucked in, and has has a nice smile, and uh, and has lots of money, and you know is not is not a kook. If that right, happens, I... then then. How then is Hillary comes along? Is she electable in those circumstances? I think it's I think it's more of a horse race at least. And now my friends, when I try that out on them, they say, "Well, that's impossible. Republicans can't do that." Well, Democrats keep keep counting on the incompetence of Republicans and right. extremism, and then they keep throwing up John McCain and Mitt Romney and George Bush, who was very moderate, seen as a compassionate conservative, yeah. and and then they're they're. They're like Lucy with the football or whatever. They're perennially surprised. Right. 
And when Jeb Bush or someone else presentable comes along, they're going to be surprised again. Yeah. And Hillary will tack to the right because that's what they do yeah. in these circumstances. The base will become further discouraged. Yeah. I'll tell you, you know, the only thing going for them is the democratic is demographic shift. That's a, but, but if they can't get those people out to vote, they're going to be in trouble. And whenever I, I talk to people about this, I just get... I, I, it, it's like there is a, a, a fortress mentality and... You, if you talk like you're outside the fortress, the, the shells get lobbed at. Yeah, yeah. It just gets it gets robbed. Well, I think you know this. It it, it is true, and I've I've written for over some years actually. The the the, the comparable period in American politics was the 1920s, when the Republicans had control and were enforcing a very strong line of both pro-capital, Wall Street, etc., and the banking, and but also uh, through the Supreme Court, uh, blocking all, virtually all social legislation and labor legislation for 30 years. Right. It wasn't, and that, and that whole grass wasn't broken until the, new, until the New Deal. But what happened is the Democrats shifted in that in that period with uh, Europeans and especially Eastern Europeans. Immigrants finally reaching the the sense of security and maturity to vote as citizens, and that breaking point was 1928 when Al Smith ran for president, a Democratic nomination who was Irish Catholic. That was that was really a breakthrough. Um, he he lost the presidency, but he had been governor of New York and started the reform programs, which literally became the New Deal a few years later right. under FDR. So so I think that's a pretty strong historical comparison. The, the problem is you got to have a you got to have a new dealer in the story somewhere, right? Right, right. And, and, I, I, and right now what we have, and I don't know these groups intimately, but I know some of the folks who are leaders in them, the Latinos, it seems to me, have been playing a very strong and and wise hand because what they did a couple of years ago going into the last presidential election is really push Obama hard. And they had some showdowns at the White House where, you know, he was really upset and angry with them. But they said, you're not doing anything. You're doing all this other stuff. You keep making nice speeches, but we're not going to be with you unless you get off your seat. And, uh, and it worked. And he started doing things, and he made, you know, I forget the details, the Dream Act. The Dream Act, and, so on, and all, yeah. a bunch of other moves. But the and point that, is, to I me, think... that was the political lesson that others ought to grasp and emulate. If you, and if you includes... really want this guy to do something, don't kiss him on the cheek, push him in the gut. And, and, right. and... and and that's the politics these folks can be taught to understand. But it's got to be real. It can't be just speeches. It's got to. It's got to be a genuine threat. That you know, it's not a question of the, the Latino voters staying home because they're tired of, of of the of the bad of the loose talk. They're staying home because their leaders told them to stay home. I had to ask them to and, stay home. And that's and we're going to have to we're going to have to leave it at that. But you know, I'll tell you that is the model that. You know, and it, which also means not being liked, being respected. So right. uh, that's a lesson the left is going to have to learn. Well, we could go on all day. Thanks so much for coming on, William Grider. And uh, meanwhile, I recommend to everyone your piece uh, with praise merchants of death about Ukraine. Thanks so much for coming on. The Thanks, show. Richard. Enjoy it. We'll be right back after this. I'm Richard R.J. Eskow, and this is The Zero Hour.